And really this is the ultimate of form meeting function in a, in a most beautiful, practical, inspiring way. Well, thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, it's great to see you. It's great to be part of the uh, Long Beach community. Uh, even though I don't live here, I feel like I live here because I have been driving to Long Beach since September 9th, 2012. So we've been here a while. About this afternoon I'm going to talk about how we ended up with the bridge that we have and some of the decisions we made that we made along the way in bidding it and what we did. I'm open to questions at the end, but I kind of want to talk about how did we get here and really, this is the ultimate of form meeting function in a, in a most beautiful, practical, inspiring way. So we kind of joke in construction, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. <laughs> and I think on, this, on some of these things, we got lucky and some things we were intentional, but we never, uh, we never envisioned how beautiful this structure would be in the end. And what's also exciting is I sit, we sit down there uh, with the port in the integrated project office there right on uh, second, not second, ocean, uh, right across the street from the Hilton. I can look out my window on the third floor anytime and I see trucks always going across the bridge. And I don't know if you know this, but March was an incredible record month for the port of Long Beach with the number of containers that came in. So just a huge record. And so I actually enjoy it because I am a civil engineer and I work for a contractor. And part of what civil engineers do is we bring improvements to the public and the traveling public and usually it never goes noticed. In fact, if we get noticed, it's a bad day. Something went wrong. So we like to not be noticed, but, uh, but it's wonderful to see the facility being used. And I, how many of you drove on the, uh, the old Gerald Desmond Bridge? And how many of you drove on the new one? Don't you all of a sudden feel safe on that new bridge and you didn't? <laughs> And that old bridge with the tight lanes and the grade and the trucks breaking down, you just feel safe on the new bridge. So it's great to see. Okay. So, background on how we got to where we're at today. So the port and the, the, the port and the, and Caltrans started uh, looking at this project, I think back in 2003, maybe 2001, maybe 2001. So they spent about 10 years coming up um, to define the scope, the structure, what it was going to be. They did, they did uh, type of structure studies and they came up with the Cable State Bridge. And then they put it out to be designed build, partly for funding reasons, uh, for, to get one of the demonstration projects for the uh, state of California for design build. So they put it out to that. The contractor would come in as a single unit lump sum uh, to be the designer and the contractor of it. So we went and teamed with Arup, who's an international designer based out of the UK who's done cable state bridges around the world. And then Shemek is a local contractor in California. And then we team with two other international contractors, FCC Construction and Impregilo, now laying in the US, because we needed their expertise on these complex type of structures. So we're looking at the job, it's 2011. We know we have about six to eight months to bid the job. And you got the east approach, uh, east structures, east approach structures, and the west approach. You got the cable state bridge, a thousand foot main span, and we have about eight months to make some decisions and what we're going to do. So when we bid the job, we talk about critical path. Critical path is a means of what is the way to get from point A to point B the fastest, and what's going to stop you on the critical path. And the critical path of the job actually went through the approach structures, not the cable state bridge. By the way, all the glory we say is in the superstructure. You look at the superstructure, and a lot of these pictures are of the superstructure or paintings, but they don't have many of people drilling holes in the ground. It's not that exciting. But all the work is getting out of the ground, and all the glory is in the superstructure. So as I said, the critical path went through the approach structures, and on that you have dual bridges. So you can now envision it because you've driven it. You have dual bridges going up both sides. And those approach structures are significant structures by themselves because there are three lanes in each direction, full 10 foot, 10 foot inside shoulder, outside shoulder. In fact, the other day I was driving the bridge and it was wonderful that a semi was broken down in a lane on the right, didn't even get over to the shoulder. Did it stop traffic? No. In the past, you could look, I could look out my window and I knew when a semi broke down because it stopped traffic on the whole bridge. So we're extremely, at least for me, it's very gratifying 
when the port is seeing the largest volume that they've ever seen in TEUs coming in, that that bridge is there and being used for the good of the, of the community and the facility and the, and the whole Southern California region and the nation, because 15% of all goods that come into the U.S. go over that bridge. That's why we dubbed it, uh, at least the port did, they dubbed it the, port, the bridge to everywhere. So, so we have those, we have about 70 bents, we call them bents or columns out there and locations. And so we spent quite a bit of time talking about span arrangement. And when's the last time you talked span arrangement? It's, <laughs> it's something you just don't talk on a regular basis. So a, a span arrangement is, uh, as we're looking at where we're gonna put each column or bent, how long it's gonna be, you have a balanced frame analysis if you don't know this, it's the short spans that are um, spans that are not as deep, that they, they, they uh, attract all the, all the movement from an earthquake, so you actually have to make those columns a lot artificially deeper. So we looked at the span arrangement, and we were scared of the foundations. So when we looked at the foundations, um, you don't know this, but you, pro you probably don't dig down near the port. But if you dig down five, seven feet, what are you gonna hit? water so you have water so all these are all these foundations and shafts are full of water it's tough to actually pour a nice shaft with water there it upsets it <laughs> and then over on the west side west of the channel there's an artesian condition and um, and that made it complex because they're constantly dewatering for NRG we call it a hole in the ocean because they're sucking it down because NRG sunk when the island sunk uh, in, the, um, in the 60s, and it's minus it's 10 feet below uh, sea level. So somewhere down, we get below what we call this aquitard, about 60 feet down. Your water level in your shaft at that point, and it, it's, it's right at sea level at minus three. When we drilled through that, we hit the artesian condition, and it would jump from a minus three to a plus eight, so a 12 foot jump. So if you're at the ground, you have a stream of water coming out. So we had to adjust our casings, and we had to build a grade up, and we had to keep our casings full of water as we drilled to keep a positive head on that. So a little engineering for you. So anyway, we were greatly concerned about the foundations when we bid the job. That was our concern. So we actually made long spans, about 220 to 240 feet column to column. So once we did that and we figured out the full span arrangement, we now had to go and deal with the type of structure that we were going to build. So what type of structure are we going to build? So we evaluate, I'm still talking approach structures. I'll talk the uh, main span in a little bit. So what type of approach structure can we build? Uh, how many of you drive freeways and underpasses? So you, you probably don't stop and look up at the bridges, do you? So if you ever look up at the bridges, you'll see that it's a normal, I call it a multi-cell boring box girder bridge. So it's, uh, if you've ever built a, a remodel on your house, and you've seen, if you have a raised floor, you have joists that go across, and you have that, or you have your ceiling for your second floor. Similar on a bridge, so you have these girders that go across, and it's a multi-cell, and then you put a deck across, you put uh, uh, steel in it, you put post tension through it to pull it tight, and that's what it is, but it has little stubby overhangs. If you've been out underneath our bridge, you've noticed some beautiful wide overhangs out there. It's very different. And that's because we chose to go with a different bridge type. So we could have done what we call the precast segmental. And that's where you go build about, I don't know, 10, 12 foot wide pieces. You go cast them all up. I got a big job in Hawaii going for, uh, for a transit system. And that's five miles of precast. So about 3,500 segments we cast in place. But we did a segmental cast in place. And that's when we, once we decided to do that, we were then gonna use the movable scaffolding system. Moveable scaffolding system is those big orange and blue structures you saw when it was being constructed. And that's seen in the paintings around, like there's one with the pour going on from one bridge to the other, and it's seen in the photos. And so once we did decide the moveable scaffolding system, that opened up the window for us on aesthetics. Now we didn't necessarily do it for aesthetics. Again, we're trying to win a job. So we're bidding this in a competition of, of uh, best value, which is a combination of a technical proposal and a low price. So that's how we're bidding this. So we come up with the MSS. My European partners say, oh, trust me, it's easy. We do this in Europe all the time. 
no one imagined how much rebar would have to be in those and how long it would take. And if you've been up there, you see the amount of rebar over those columns. We call them bent, ca bent caps. And it should make you feel very comfortable that there's so much rebar there. And, and basically, everything we know today from earthquakes is empirical knowledge. So we know it from past mistakes. So what was the earthquake up on the 14? I think in 92, 94, there was an earthquake up on the 15 and the 14, I'm sorry, the 14 and the 5. And it's the first time they saw it that the columns actually punched through the superstructure. And the bridge collapsed right through the columns because they saw such a vertical acceleration in the earthquake. So what do we do after that? We put a boatload of rebar on those bit caps from coming out of Caltrans and what they want now. So we have a huge amount of rebar out there, then a huge amount of post-tensioning where you run all these strands through the girders and then you pull tight to help, to help keep it in place. So the benefit, the benefit of the movable scaffolding system if you get out there is the really wide overhangs. You can have nice steep side girders. If you, see, if, if you haven't been out below, get out there below Hopefully the harbor police won't pull you over. They, if they see you parking, they find you. They have cameras all over the place. But you get out below and look, and you'll see these nice steep girders with a big wide overhang. And this is where we got lucky. This is where the form meets function. We did not know how beautiful those lines would be when we built the bridge. We were just trying to build something economical. And when we were looking at it out there also, the... Um, there's double elevation, we're up in the air, the approach structures get up about 180, 190 feet. We're up in the air, and we thought that's really too high to build false work, where you see all this pipe false work going, it's too high to do that. We weren't gonna do segmental. So we had this movable scaffolding system, and then it gave us really wide overhangs. So now when you stand below and look up, and you can see the beautiful lines of the bridge, that's where we got lucky. But it really is, and so as we were building the bridge, I was amazed when I stopped and looked at it, especially on the curves, <coughs> we had to decide how much, what the curves could be horizontally for how much that movable scaffolding system could move because it basically comes in little 10 foot tangents of formwork. And those things were about, uh, I'm good, those things were about three million pounds of steel uh, that we used and moved. It had all these screw jacks too so you could adjust the super elevation. You, don't, you probably don't notice this when you drive but we kind of turned it into a racetrack for the uh, stuff. So, so normally you have a nice cross curve, a nice cross section of, a, of a maybe a 2% grade. But when you go through curves, you transition and it goes up just like, it, so we have super elevation. So the, all that can be adjusted for, the, for those curves. So I encourage you to go out there and see under the bridge if you can. Um, but we got lucky on that. But beautiful lines. And then um, it's really fun to see the pictures and the paintings around of all of the uh, work that was done. And I think you could talk to the artists. They were pretty fascinated uh, with the movable scaffolding system as it moved and went. Uh, and even though it was stationary, uh, the wonderful part is they've captured this. It looks like it's moving in all their pictures. It's, it it's really does. So they really captured it well. So we had similar fortune on the towers. Similar aesthetic fortune on the tower. So you can look at the towers and you can see them like there's a nice painting there <coughs> And you notice that it's kind of wider and it's an octagon at the bottom and it's transitioning to uh, To a small square or a diamond at top So the question is how did we get there? Are we that good that we got there and designed it? That's the question so when the port uh, did their preliminary design we, we, we were told where we had to have the mono towers. They told us where to go so you'd have the thousand foot main span. But when they did the preliminary design, each tower, once it got above the deck, they had dual towers going up. And we looked at that and we said, well, crap, that's expensive. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it's because all of a sudden you have to form it twice and now pour it twice. And then these had these uh, new type of seismic shear links between the tower and it was a new device that would have to be approved by Caltrans. And you'd never want to have to get a new device approved by Caltrans <laughs> when time is of the essence. It will take you three years. So that would take up our whole duration to build the bridge. So we changed the design to a mono tower. And then we put these things called hydraulic dampers at the deck level. And if you drive by the bridge and you go slow, you can look over, at least the longitudinal, you can see these giant, looks like shock absorbers up there. And that's to isolate the seismic movement at the deck. Each of those can take 900,000 pounds of force. 
So together you're going to get about 1.8 million pounds of force that it can absorb and move when the earthquake comes. Now the Cable State Bridge is very uh, flexible. It can move. And, and you can picture it during an earthquake, it can move quite a bit. In fact, that tower, before it will collapse, this is, a, this is for your comfort, not to scare you. <laughs> that tower during an earthquake, it can move about 30 feet out of plumb. 30 feet out of plumb because it's designed to be essentially elastic with all the rebar detailing. And the earthquake's designed to withstand the 10% chance of the largest earthquake happening in a thousand years. It's a big earthquake. And it's designed to have no damage for the 60% uh, chance of a largest earthquake happening in 100 years. So it's, it's designed to last, besides that. So, so it's very flexible, so we isolated the movement of the seismic event at the deck level that enabled us not to carry the load down the towers to the foundations. It's isolated there. So again, it made it more economical. And then I only needed 12 8 foot 3 inch diameter shafts that went down 180 foot deep at the foundation instead of maybe 20. So again, it's economical to isolate it. So we did that. But how did we end up with the shape? So our designer, Arup, had a, a, a recently, it was finished in design, it was called Stonecutter Bridge uh, in Hong Kong. I don't know if you've been to Hong Kong recently in China, it's a beautiful cable state bridge, it goes from the mainland to the island. But it's a, it's a circular tower that goes up. And it's in constant transition, both horizontally and vertically with the camber. And so as a nice US contractor, we said, crap, how do we build that? Because that's constant transition, that makes it difficult. So we said, what if we come up with something like a circle and we make it an octagon? So let's make it an octagon at the bottom. We can keep that same constant vertical camber as it goes up because you don't need as thick of tower on the top as you do on the bottom to absorb the forces. And then we said, let's keep four sides constant, horizontally of the octagon. So I only have to worry about burying the formwork for the other four sides. And so that's how we got up the transition to go from an octagon to a diamond at the top. And this is where we got lucky. This is just form meeting function. We were thinking of how to build it and how to keep it uh, simple so that we can manage it and survey it and build it. And, but we had no idea how beautiful it would turn out. And so they have some pictures in there and some of the paintings capture it. But I encourage you, have someone else drive. Don't you stare at the top of the tower <laughs> while you drive. But I encourage you to just notice as you drive down and you're looking at the stays as it ties into the top of the tower, it almost looks like that tower, the top is kind of moving and turning. And it's not. It's not. Yeah, so it, it, that's where I say we got lucky, but we, it's really form meeting function. So, so that's how we ended up with these beautiful towers. In fact, when we did, uh, when we did design it and we were talking to the selection committee, uh, they said, we've never seen towers like this. We've had people look in Europe. So they'd never seen a mono tower before that went from an octagon to a diamond. And for us, it was just kind of a simple decision. Again, we made all these decisions in six to seven months because we had to get a bid put together. We had to get it designed and estimated. And uh, we always say, what's your story? Decide on your story. Go. Don't go back. Think. Get, get it down. And don't worry about what other people say because you got to go. A little different when you're bidding it. So, how do we get hooked up with the artist? That's the question. As, as normal, all good things come to you through your wife or spouse. So I'm married to Nancy. Nancy is a long-term friend with Tina, who's here, and they went to grad school at USC together. And, um, and Tina um, is a writer and poet, and taught some in the area. And then her husband, uh, Jose uh, Sanchez, taught at Cal State Fullerton, and Tina and Jose Cal State Long Beach. I live in Fullerton. I apologize. That's wrong to say that. Cal State Long Beach. So, so they would invite us over to what they called their artist salons. And Dominic would share. Uh, Dominic, um, where's his last name? Katara. Katara. He would share. And Betty's here, uh, uh, Dominic's uh, wife. And they would share about the art and do it. And I felt like a fish out of water because I'm an engineer and what is my creation, right? I, my creation is I married a wonderful wife, that's it. So, um, so they would share. <coughs> so I got to know them there. 
And there was occasionally when I would bring something in and share something. I shared the, a bunch of the renderings that one night back in, uh, I think, 2012 when we did it. But then later, uh, Tina uh, and, Don, and Jose were hosting a film um, over at the Museum of Latin American Art in Long Beach, up over here, I think, off of Alameda. And it was a documentary on Simon Bolivar. So we went because we're longtime fans of their work and have been with them on the journey. And so we go to see that. And then I hear at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the presentation, uh, I'm standing up, but I'm hearing people talk behind me how they don't like the new Gerald Desmond Bridge. And they're saying they like the old one, the new one. I'm not going to mention names. So I turned. <laughs> So I turned and talked to them. I said, really, you should come out and see the new bridge. You should come out. It has wonderful lines. And I just challenged them to come see. And I know I, you, you, you have change, and the old bridge is, uh, has a character to it, right? And so, but, but, and so a lot of times people don't like change. <laughs> At that point, Helen, who wasn't the person who said this, she said, uh, she said, oh, really? I said, yeah, I'm working on that bridge. She said, can you get me access? And I said, and this was in 2018. And, and she said, yeah, we were here, we were students of Dominic, and I had such high regard for Dominic. I said, sure, I can get you access up on the bridge. So that's how we got the artist access on the bridge. So then I just set it up, and I, you know, that's the nice thing about being manager. I just set it up with people, and uh, got them hooked up with our safety manager and a couple key uh, foreman superintendents up there, and then they adopted the artists on the bridge. So you would see them up there in their little pink uh, pop-up uh, shade, and the guys really bonded to the artists. In fact, and I'd say the artists bonded to the guys. And so, Bonnie, it's not just the engineers, it's the, it's the craft that built it. And we have some here, so we had the operators, the laborers, the carpenters, the iron workers, the cement finishers. And what we forget, and, and this is, I don't wanna call it arrogance on our part, but we forget the basis of a human being as they do their work, they are essentially creating themselves. And I think this is why they validated the artists because the artists were validating their work. So the artists are capturing what they're doing and saying this has incredible value. And they're saying, we're so glad you see it because we come here and work every day and we are creating this, but no one really appreciates it. So it was really just one of those, I think, unique connections on a deep level of people appreciating what they each brought uh, to the world. So the artists then have captured this, but to me what's deeper than the art is gonna be the lasting relationships and the effect that the artists have had on the craft and the craft has had on the art. And so I'm kind of excited just to be a little bystander. I would come by and I would talk to you guys about, about once every two months, say, how are you doing? <laughs> See that, that's good. Uh, but you were running with it. So that's how we got connected on the artists up there, is all from uh, relationships within the community and, and just, it's one of those kind of surprises in life. You can call it a divine appointment, a blessing from God, serendipity, you name it. But it was one of those uh, kind of surprises that at the right time, at the right place, even though someone said something that was completely wrong, <laughs> uh, good came out of it. <laughs> and there is a, there is a, Could it have been wrong if it came out of it? <laughs> it could have. Well, uh, uh, I will quote uh, the Apostle Paul, Romans 8, 28, God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him or those who are called according to his purpose. I'll just, I'll just throw that as a covering over the whole thing. How's that? I'll go deeper theologically with you. So that was wonderful to see, um, to see the artists connect with the craft on a deep level and appreciate it. So we had them. So the port had their official opening out there on, um, I think, on a Friday. And then we had a celebration on Saturday uh, with the guys and engineers and some of the craft. And the artists were out there, too. And again, it really, people really enjoyed talking to them on a Saturday, and then we opened the bridge on, Oct on October 5th. Um, some fun little facts for you on the bridge, and then I'm open to questions. Uh, you probably don't think about this, but um, every time we surveyed that bridge and the tower, because uh, the tower went up in 18-foot lifts, and we had to survey it to make sure it's in the right place. And so um, you may not know this, 
but the tower was built perfectly plumb. But um, because of the bike path that Bonnie was an advocate for to get added, and that's added on the um, added on the south side, a 12-foot wide bike path. It's a even though we put a, a, a balanced can, a balanced load on this side, the tower leans to the south about eight inches, seven or eight inches, because it's it's not symmetrically loaded. But it was designed to be that way. So, but you probably don't even notice that. It to the south towards the water, because that's where that on the cable stays. So it's 12 foot more. We have concrete, if you ever notice, with some railing. We did pour some balanced uh, um, frames over there, not balanced, but uh, just an extra load to try to help balance it out. But it still leans a little bit, eight inches. So back to the survey. Every time we surveyed this, and it's going up at 18 foot lifts, and we have our forms, and we have self climbing DOCA forms, we surveyed it at 2 a.m. every time we did it. And you probably don't think about that, but you notice it's intuitive, it's thermo. If the sun comes up, it heats up the steel, and the steel moves. So you don't know if you have the right, you don't know if you're in the right place. So we surveyed it at 2 a.m. every time to be consistent, to make sure we surveyed it so we didn't have the thermal movement of it. So we had all these things that went into, so we kind of joke that you can, uh, you build a bridge, but it's very tough to beat physics. Because I don't know how many of you beat gravity recently, but you have gravity. <laughs> and as you get older, you make different noises that come out of your body as you fight gravity. <laughs> especially when you get up and sit down and, and then sometimes you drop things and you say that's not worth even getting. <laughs> so, so we had to spend a lot of time on temporary engineering and works and making sure that our, the properties of our materials were correct as we built the bridge, when we did it. And the concrete pores replacement over here, we have a concrete placement going on in this painting here and you see the two pumps. And so we constantly had to monitor the, uh, the temperature of the concrete. And you get over, uh, I think it's seven feet in any direction. Considered mass concrete. So we had cooling tubes that went through it. So it wouldn't get over 160 degrees. Concrete gets over 160 degrees. It changes it at the molecular level. And then we'll, it will actually then start um, degrading maybe 30 years down the road. So we had to monitor all the temperature in the concrete. When we did those placements, it was about 800 cubic yards. At the most, you can fit 10 yards in a, in a ready-mix truck. We did eight yards, so that's about um, that's 100 trucks that are coming up there. But it was cycling because we, we had a ready-mix plant right on site, so just four or five trucks going the whole time. It was so we wouldn't have to uh, clog up traffic. One of the other things we did that we focus on a lot that gets no glory is maintenance of traffic because we're building this bridge through with the existing bridge keeping it open. So we spent a lot of time looking at detours. And one of the, and I'll end with this, I'll end with this story. So uh, one of the best ideas that came up on maintenance of traffic was uh, where we had, and may, some of you may have driven this and it may have scared you, but uh, <laughs> uh, we were pretty good compared to other jobs, just so you know. But coming, uh, coming from San Pedro over and getting off to go up Pico, we had a triple left there. And we had a triple left with, uh, with uh, big semis making that triple left. And uh, people, so I did it so could, we could recover some time on the delay of the main span, because the main span was delayed uh, due to um, some design stuff, arguments. So, um, so we could put traffic on that and then finish up building the northbound frame. Anyway, when we did that, everybody said, this can't be done. It's never been done before. And I gave instructions to the technical team, the engineers. I said, I want you to give, don't give the port a technical reason to say no. And that's maybe something in your life. Don't give, when you're dealing with something difficult, don't give them a technical reason to say no. Then it's a matter of the will. And you can usually talk to people. Well, I got an idea. What if we set it up and build it and we test it for two weeks? We'll go test it and make sure it works before we go demo. So we did that and we got it built and it greatly saved our time, great benefit to the port, kept, kept uh, traffic moving through the port and that then allowed us to open the bridge on October 5th. So that basically concludes my remarks.